Good evening, everyone. My name's Anne Dobbing, and I'm a member of the core group of the Scottish Laity Network. And tonight, it's my privilege to welcome you to the second evening of our Advent journey, 2023. The title is Waiting in Grief for Peace, The Power of Lament. So, as is our tradition, let us now spend time in prayer, reflecting on the signs of the time. We invite you to listen to an Aramaic chant of the second beatitude according to Matthew. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so tonight, we're continuing our programme by reflecting on guilty bystanders with our companion Muriel Pearson. And to introduce and welcome Muriel, I'm delighted to hand over to Marion Pallister, the chair of Pax Christi Scotland. We are very grateful that Pax Christi are co-badging our evening. And Marion will say a few words about Pax Christi Scotland and then welcome and introduce our companion for this evening. Over to you, Marion. Thank you so much and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about Pax Christi Scotland and more importantly uh, about Reverend Muriel Pearson. Two strands that um, are very closely linked in my life in 2023. As chair of Pax Christi Scotland, uh, one of my tasks is to organise the online events that we began during lockdown, but found were an ideal way, as indeed SLN has done, um, to have such events uh, always because we can reach out not only to our members who are scattered around Scotland, but also to reach people across our common home and to be able to invite international speakers to join us. Uh, and all of our events are, are still available on our website. The situation in the Holy Land obviously has been a priority for a peace organization like ours. Uh, we're a member organization of Pax Christi International, which was set up after the Second World War uh, to seek a non-violent world. And to be granted that status, we had to seek the approval of the Scottish Bishops' Conference, which has always been very supportive on the Holy Land issue. In June, I organized an event called The Holy Land Seeking a Non-Violent Future, and Muriel Pearson had not long taken up a Church of Scotland post in Bethlehem, and so she was an obvious choice to invite as a speaker. 
and very graciously accepted that invitation. I also in, in, invited a, an, an old friend of Pax Christi Scotland, a Dr. Abdel Fattah Abusrawa, who grew up in a Palestinian refugee camp before studying for his PhD in Paris. Um, and he went back to the Holy Land and set up uh, a community centre that empowers children and young people in Palestine with what he calls a, a beautiful resistance. Um, it's an organisation that uh, is, is based on non-violent resistance by providing alternative activities uh, and therapeutic outlets for anger. And you'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, his concept of a beautiful resistance obviously chimes with our own aims for a non-violent world. And our third guest back in June was Paul Gibson, who'd recently returned from Scotland to Scotland from a three-month placement on the ecumenical accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel in the South Hebron Hills. In September, I organised a second online event called The View from the Occupied Territories, this time with just one guest speaker, uh, Louis Aber. I, I'm sorry, Callum is going to shout at me for this because I get it wrong every time. Um, Louis Aberbouge is the Jewish diaspora educational coordinator of Breaking the Silence. That's an organization of veteran soldiers who've served in the Israel, Israeli military since the start of the Second Intifada and have taken it upon themselves to expose the public to the reality of everyday life in the occupied territories. Endeavoring to stimulate public debate about the price paid for a reality in which young soldiers face a civilian population on a daily basis and are engaged in the control of that population in everyday life. Its work aims to bring an end to the occupation. He believes that the military rule and occupation of Palestinian territories are inherit inherently immoral and are the biggest threat to Israel's democratic future. He said, by working together to break the silence, we can help people see the reality for themselves and change the reality of the, on the ground. And then of course, came October the 7th and everything changed, as you've just seen in those very, very moving slides. As an organization, Pax Christi Scotland holds the belief that Israel is operating an apartheid regime and this conflict's history stretches back many, many decades. We were, of course, worried about the safety of all four of our speakers. We make deep connections when people talk to us about their lives in difficult situations, and we hadn't known how difficult their lives were about to become. I'd also known Muriel before she took up her post as a Church of Scotland mission partner, ministering at St Andrew's Church of Scotland, Jerusalem and Tiberias. When I emailed her after October the 7th, I received a quick and reassuring response. That's the kind of person that Muriel is. She returned to Scotland with what she described as a heavy heart, but instead of taking time to reflect on her own situation, she sent the, the Church of Scotland's Glasgow Presbytery um, prayer pointers for personal prayer about the conflict. Muriel's been a Church of Scotland minister in Glasgow. She, she'd been a minister for 17 years before heading uh, for her work in the Holy Land, uh, working in Cran Hill in the east end of Glasgow. And she was formerly a secondary school guidance teacher. She's been a trustee of the reconciliation organization Place for Hope. And she studied the principles of nonviolent communication saying that she all, has always been very interested in how we learn to talk to one another in respective creative 
and safe ways. She has already made her mark in her new role and continues to write a, a wonderfully inspiring blog called Stepping Out of the Boat. Please have a look for that online. Since her return to Scotland, she's been busy with interviews and talks, and so we're very lucky to have her with us this evening. She's described herself as a person of peace, interested in dialogue and aware that polarizing conversation is sterile. Thank you so much for being with us, Muriel. Over to you. Well, thank you, Marion, for that very warm welcome. It's my great pleasure to be with you this evening. And I want to thank the organizers of tonight's Advent Journey for giving me the gift of the title, Guilty Bystanders. It has stayed with me over the weeks of my return from Israel to Scotland. It has rubbed like a pebble in my shoe and provoked me. And it's a privilege to be able to share some of your thoughts, some of my thoughts with you this evening. Now, it looks to me as if the slideshow is not as has not opened in the right place, Rab. It looks like it's stuck, is it? Should be at the beginning of my slides, which is a picture of me with my yes, two chairs holding the space. It's on a screen with a, a candle, Muriel. I think if you if you stop the share just now. I I'm not sure. I'm yeah, I I've I don't have the PowerPoint. Rab has the PowerPoint, so it should be near the beginning. That's it, Rab. There we go. So my role in Israel Palestine is to minister to a small English speaking congregation in Tiberias, to welcome pilgrims and visitors. I'm chaplain to the Scots Hotel and to Tabitha Christian School in Jaffa. I work closely with partners pursuing a just peace in Israel, Palestine. And I try to share thoughts and insights back here in Scotland that can enrich our thinking and our praying about a very complex and intractable situation in which for many years we have been more than bystanders. When the atrocities of October 7th happened, followed by the ongoing atrocity of all out war on the Gaza Strip, normal life came to an abrupt halt. Much of what I intended to be doing seemed irrelevant or frivolous. So at the moment I'm in Glasgow, keeping in touch with people by WhatsApp or Zoom. And some of the folk I know through the hotel are now serving in the IDF. Some have been displaced because of tensions on the Lebanese border. Some have spent many hours in safe rooms in their houses. Some have been bereaved. And partners in the West Bank and Palestinian Israelis are very cautious about what they say at the moment. A like on the wrong Facebook page can get you arrested. And in Gaza, the toll of misery mounts. This infographic is old now, but it's the best I could find at the moment, the most up to date. Today, we heard that 1.9 million people, 80% of Gaza's population are internally displaced people. And it doesn't take much imagination to think about what that means in a place with no fresh water, no power, where communications drop all the time, mobile phones are, are, are very rarely able to communicate with inside or outside Gaza. So many people have died and 70% of those killed have been women and children. Thomas Merton, whose 
words are our provocation this evening was a Trappist monk. He literally felt his role was to stand removed from the world, to be a bystander, to watch and intercede. But he came to realize two things. The first was a glorious epiphany which took place in Louisville on the corner of Fourth and Walnut, which was that all of us are connected to everyone else. There's no such thing as a bystander. And the second insight, perhaps inspired by Martin Luther King, is about the dark forces at work in economies and governments. And in that sense, because we're all enmeshed in those structures, we are all guilty bystanders. Merton says we begin with confession. We're all guilty bystanders, all implicated in systemic evil, all beneficiaries of unjust economic systems. Many of us live far from the epicenters of human suffering. We aspire to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, but none of us is guiltless. And there's the dictionary definition, bystander, a person who sees something that is happening, but is not involved. Guilty bystander, a bystander, someone who watches, holds the coats perhaps, but slightly removed, not part of the action. A guilty bystander. Oxymoron. For if one feels guilt, one is involved. So what can we do, we guilty bystanders? Learn. Lament. Protest. Face up to our responsibility. Act human in the face of inhumanity. In 1991, John Bell and Graham Mall wrote an anti-Gulf War song. John Bell says the song was both a protest against the first Gulf War and against the seeming inability of either commercial or church music to offer texts of protest or lament. Let's listen to Ian Campbell singing it. If the war goes on and the children die of hunger and the old men weep for the young men are no more and the women learn how to dance without a partner who will keep the score If the war goes on and the truth is taken hostage and new terrors lead to the need to euthanize when the calls for peace are declared unpatriotic who'll expose the lies if the war goes on and the daily bread is terror and the voiceless poor take the road as refugees when a nation's pride destines millions to be homeless who will heed their pleas if the war goes on and the rich 
rich increase their fortunes and the armed sales soar as new weapons are displayed when a fertile field turns to no man's land tomorrow who'll approve such trade if the war goes on will we close the doors to heaven if the war goes on will we breach the gates of hell if the war goes on will we ever be forgiven if the war goes on Here in the UK, we're not bystanders. Our colonial past certainly makes us complicit, even guilty. There's been a huge upsurge in interest in tracing the roots of the Israel-Palestine situation, and it's important to be informed. On your screen is a copy of the letter sent by Lord Arthur Bar Balfour, to Lord Rothschild. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist in, uh, aspirations which have been remitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government's view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be which will prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. The Balfour Project is a charity founded in 2017, a hundred years after this historic letter, not to get the UK government to apologize for its role in Palestine, but to put right some of the omissions and errors, asking the UK government to recognize the state of Palestine alongside the state of Israel and to uphold international law on human rights. One of the trustees of the Balfour Project is Sir Vincent Fien, formerly British Consul General in Jerusalem. A few weeks ago, he spoke to Al Jazeera about Britain's historic and current role. Well, Vincent Fien is a former British Consul General in Jerusalem. He's also a trustee for the Balfour Project charity, which says its mission is to address the UK's responsibility for peace and security in Israel and Palestine. He joins me live from London. Good to have you with us. So do you agree with those who say that it was the Balfour Declaration that laid the foundation for conflict in the region? I believe that on this 106th um, anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, that declaration is still alive because its impact is still with us and it has led to conflict. The document that you read out, uh, the very short promise to the Zionist uh, leader in the UK, um, says two things. It says a homeland for the Jewish people, but without prejudice to the civil and religious rights of non-Jewish people, which were the majority, as you said. Um, Britain's role in that time was, I would say, a policy of deceit. Um, the Balfour Project charity that you mentioned, that I'm the trustee of, uh, has a website with information, objective information about the British role. We focus on Britain. The website is balfourproject.org. 
and one of my fellow trustees has written a book, which I commend to your viewers, called A Policy of Deceit, because Britain promised the same land to the Sharif of Mecca before promising it to uh, the leader of the Zionist movement in the UK. And then during the mandate period, the, the only consistent thing that Britain did was effectively to prevent Palestine becoming an independent state for as long as there was an Arab-Palestinian majority therein. That's led to conflict, and it gives Britain a responsibility today to take a lead as a government, as a people, to try to ensure equality between Israelis and Palestinians with mutual security. The idea that unilateral security can be imposed by one people on another through the occupation is wrong, and it's being proved to be wrong tragically as we speak. I just want to pick up on something you said there. The, the only effective thing Britain did in that period was preventing an independent state of Palestine to emerge for as long as there was still a Palestinian Arab majority there. Effectively, what does that mean? Denying Palestinians of having a chance at statehood themselves. In 1948, the British planned to hand over the mandate of Palestine to the newly formed United Nations to oversee two states. The day before that happened, the state of Israel came into being. Independence for Israelis, Nakba or catastrophe for Palestinians. The UN has been involved ever since supporting refugees, calling for international law to be upheld, collecting data and reporting on human rights abuses, proposing endless resolutions about the responsibilities of an occupying force, about the illegality of settlements in the West Bank. Most of the aid and education infrastructure in Gaza was run by the UN, who have lost more than 100 staff in the current war. Many Palestinians still live in refugee camps run by the UN. The Nakba is not over, it continues. Because of the US veto in the Security Council and Europe and the UK refusing to take a committed stand against expansion of illegal settlements and other infractions of international law, the UN often seems powerless. Nevertheless, international law is all we've got. Nevertheless, truth can be spoken to power. I'm going to play a long speech, as 10 minutes, the full response in a recent debate by Palestinian representative Nadu Abu Tarbush, who speaks powerfully for her people. And I'm playing the whole speech because so often we only get sound bites if we hear from Palestinians at all in mainstream media. And I invite you to listen to her measured, powerful, well-argued response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Given that a number of states have spoken about Palestine directly, we have prepared three replies, which we will read one after the other, and we kindly ask for your indulgence in that regard. We will first respond to Israel's statement. Mr. Chair, at the outset, let us remind Israel that our name is not the Palestinian Authority, but the State of Palestine. Sure, your finance minister said at an event in Paris earlier this year, there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. And your prime minister on the 24th of September held up a map at the General Assembly entitled The New Middle East, in which Palestine was deleted and replaced entirely with Israel. But if your government is annexationist and racist, this body is not, and we ask you to kindly adhere to UN protocol and nomenclature and to show respect to all stakeholders in this room. 
Let us also remind the Israeli delegate that the lack of rules of procedure for this meeting does not give carte blanche to lose all sense of decorum when speaking to interlocutors in this room. To the other states and civil society in the room, let me simplify Israel's statement for you. Other than throwing insults around and making grave, baseless accusations, Israel said something that should make all of you shudder. It effectively said, I can kill any and every person in Gaza. The 2.3 million people in Gaza are either terrorists or terrorist sympathizers or human shields and are therefore legitimate targets. Every person, according to Israel, falls into one of these three categories. A child, a journalist, a doctor, a UN staff, a newborn baby in an incubator. And so, according to Israel, it can kill them and then have the audacity to come to this room and tell the world with a straight face, we are acting in accordance with international law. The death of each of the over 11,350 people killed over the past month, be it children, journalists, UN staff, the sick, the elderly, according to Israel, was justified. Think about that for a moment and let it give you pause. Anyone espousing this warped logic has no shred of humanity, no sense of morality, and no knowledge of legality. But guess what? Your carpet explanation for carpet bombing will not fly. People are not fools. The people in this room are seasoned diplomats who are well-read, have a knowledge of history, and many of whom have seen your government make the same arguments during your six previous military aggressions on Gaza in the past 15 years. They have seen you resort to collective punishment, targeting of Palestinian children, journalists, medical staff, aid workers before. They have seen you forcibly transfer our communities, colonize our lands, demolish our homes, and evict families from their own properties since the 7th of October and for the 75 years that preceded it. They have seen your state-sponsored disinformation campaign before. Again, not fools, don't insult our intelligence. By saying that it is acting in accordance with international law, Israel is effectively saying the UN Secretary, Secretary General, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the WHO, UNICEF, OCHA, UN Special Rapporteurs, the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry on the Situation, human rights organizations worldwide, disarmament NGOs worldwide, humanitarian NGOs worldwide, countless legal experts are all wrong. Everyone is lying about Israel violating international law and we are asked instead to believe Israel, the state that is actually doing the indiscriminate killing. It is interesting that by saying even wars have rules, Israel quoted the very same UN Secretary General whose resignation it has called for because he dared to say that Israel has a history of occupying Palestinian land. The dissonance of hearing the Israeli representative talk about wars having rules as it commits genocide and breaches every rule in the book live on our TV screens is quite something. To Israel we say, we see through your PR and disinformation. The whole world sees through your PR and disinformation. The millions of people filling the streets in every major capital of the world, calling you out for genocide, sees through your PR and disinformation. Perhaps you think that with your incendiary rhetoric, we will all forget the incitement, the declarations and acts of Israeli officials, the people you represent, to wipe out Gaza, to drop a nuclear bomb on the Palestinian people, to destroy the human animals and children of darkness. 
Perhaps you think that your constant intimidation and threatening language will make everyone overlook the fact that Israel is, as we speak, killing babies, youth, women, men, elderly, no one too small or too old or too sick to be spared its wrath. Perhaps you think that by cutting off telecommunications and imposing yet another blackout on Gaza, you can continue to commit genocide while avoiding the annoyance of people being able to use their phones and computers to report on it. Perhaps you think that as your trigger-happy soldiers continue to kill journalists, 41 so far, the highest number of journalists killed over a four-week period than in any conflict in the last three decades, you think that no one will be left to expose your crimes. Perhaps you think that by si trying to silence anyone who tries to speak about your crimes, the international law violations of a state, by calling them either anti-Semites or terror supporters, people will be silent. And your intimidation campaign knows no bounds. They attack Palestinians, Jews, Israelis, UN officials, politicians, parliamentarians, university professors, and anyone worldwide who calls you out for your violations of international law. But guess what? Your intimidation and silencing will not work. We, along with all peace-loving nations and along with all people of conscience around the world, will not be silent. We will continue to call you out on your crimes, to call for accountability for your violations, for sanctions as your government continues to reject calls for a ceasefire, to massacre our people, and to entrench your colonial occupation and apartheid regime. Something your country should have learned over the past 75 years is that, is that the Palestinian people are a people who refuse to disappear. And your nuclear threats and your bombs and your tanks and your bulldozers will never break the Palestinian people's will to be free and to live in the dignity and peace to which all people are entitled. Unlike you, we have consistently stood in this forum calling for respect for international law, for ethical principles to guide state behavior, for peace over war, for humanity over national interests, for disarmament over destruction. Once again, we stand in this forum to call on all states to respect and ensure respect for international law. Let the law be the measure by which all are judged, not propaganda and hateful, biased spin steeped in racism. And to Israel's absurd assertion that Palestinians have a problem with people of Jewish faith, and give the impression that this is a religious conflict, let us say it loud and clear, this is not and has never been about religion. Had the occupiers of our land or the violators of our rights been Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, or of any other conviction, we would have called them out all the same. Palestine has always been multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious. People of Jewish faith have lived in historic Palestine as Palestinians for centuries. We consider them to be our brothers and sisters. And since the memory of the Holocaust has been invoked, let us also say loud and clear, we have the greatest of solidarity with both the victims and survivors of the Holocaust. It was not Palestinians that committed that horrific genocide, but the fascist forces that spawned from Europe. And it is unconscionable that a number of European leaders are again beating the drum as another genocide is now underway in Gaza. We are united with those hundreds of thousands of Jews around the world, including from organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, Naamod UK, who are calling out this genocide and chanting in the streets of New York, London, Paris, Berlin, Sydney, Toronto, and all major Western cities so that their governments can hear, not in our name, end the genocide in Gaza. With them, we stand together to end this pain and suffering. Together, we will not allow this to happen, never again, 
is now. The current UN Special Rapporteur for the Occupied Palestinian Territories is Francesca Albanese. She's a lawyer committed to bringing to public attention the human rights abuses she documents. The day after Hamas's massacre and kidnapping of civilians and the start of the war, whose stated aim was to remove Hamas, Albanese said, I am totally petrified. I'm shocked and appalled by the violence, but before anything else, I'm horrified by the narrative because it is possible and necessary to stand both with the Palestinians and the Israelis without resorting to ethical relativism, to selective outrage, or worse, calls for violence. Policymakers should prioritise restoring legality and accountability, restoring diplomacy and peace, rather than advocating for more violence or standing with one side or the other. And of course, there's the weapons and the arms manufacturers. When Israel responded to Hamas's attack, fulsome support was given by many governments, including the US and the UK. The US supplies most of the weapons and pays for the Israeli military. Shareholders in arms companies are doing very well, but none of us are innocent. All of us are guilty bystanders. As Merton says, we must begin with confession. We're going to hear a short prayer chant which repeats and while we listen to it please add your comments and thoughts into the chat perhaps about something you've heard, something you want to question but perhaps most of all what you think we need to confess as individuals as countries, as part of the Axis selling arms to Israel and yet at the same time urging restraint. Please use your chat feature.
If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We hold together a moment of silence. Amen. If we play with the word bystander, we can come up with a new definition. A bystander is someone who stands by or with another. A companion, a supporter. Dave Hardman, Methodist liaison officer in Jerusalem, who, like me, is currently in the UK, wanted to devise some kind of way that our Advent liturgy might reflect our acknowledgement of the horror and distress being experienced in the Holy Land at this time. The second candle in the Advent ring is sometimes known as the Bethlehem candle. So Dave's suggestion, which has been taken up by a number of churches, is not to light that candle this year, but to reflect on the words that the heads of churches and patriarchs in Jerusalem wrote to their flocks, calling for a time of spiritual reflection when celebration is not possible. Here's a liturgy using the 10th of November statement as its inspiration. The Advent candle not lighting liturgy. The lights don't shine in Bethlehem this Advent time. Too much suffering and uncertainty. Too much loss and grief. Instead, the Christian people of the Holy Land call for an end to war. Speak out for those suffering the most. Give generously to support the growing number of very needy people who have lost loved ones, homes, jobs, and face huge uncertainty. Their prayer is for a lasting peace in their beloved Holy Land. In Christ's incarnation, they look forward to a time when death shall be no more, neither mourning nor crying nor pain, for the former things have passed away. To stand with them, we choose not to light the second candle in our Advent wreath. And we pray, come, Emmanuel, God with us. Come, be with your suffering people now. The old priest Zechariah, tongue unstopped, sings praise to God, speaks of the liberation of his people, a mighty saviour, and foresees that John, his newborn son, will be a prophet who prepares the way. His ecstatic song finishes, because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. These are dark days, but I want to share some glimpses of dawn. First of all, Magon Inon, an Israeli peace activist, and Mira Awad, a Palestinian songwriter and singer, speaking to Kay Burley on Sky News. They were advertising a vigil uh, organized by Together for Humanity story. in London last rise. weekend. Uh, the, uh, nearest Israeli village to the border with the Gaza Strip. Um, and we um, were very shocked and we're still very sad and we miss them. 
Um, but it's also important for us to say that out, out of that personal pain, um, we as a family thought that it is very important to share our parents' legacy, which is treating other people with respect and seeing the humanity in people. I mean, there's many difficult conversations we should have, but we should have them as one community. And maybe that starts with crying with one another over you know, the pain that everybody is being affected by. So we, we, we are one community. Um, and we need to resolve our differences in a, in a peaceful way, uh, in a way that respects human beings. You know, I admire, um, I admire Magan and his brothers and sisters, right? They have also sisters mm -hmm. for, for really um, keeping on with this amazing message because it's, you can imagine the nightmare. I can't imagine. I mean, you, I mean, you can imagine. Um, but stepping out of a nightmare like that and still sticking with the story, you know, um, we're, we're all, I'm, I'm not bereaved in, in the latest escalation. Um, I can only thank my luck for that. But, uh, but you know, we're all, we're all traumatized by everything. My father in 48 became, was expelled from his village, just like these people dis being displaced from the neighborhoods in Gaza. And now when he watches the news, I can't even imagine the trauma coming up in his body about these children and mothers, you know, going away from their houses, not knowing when they'll come back and, and the, all the people that they lost. Um, but my father, with all these memories of displacement and of the humiliation and the military regime that we went through, did not teach me to hate Israelis or Jewish people. Did not teach that, even with all the pain that he went through. And I think we got it, we got it from him eventually. Um, how to step out of a, of a nightmare and, and, to, and to stay human and to stay with empathy and solidarity with other human life. And I carry that with me all my life. And, you know, I think it's the most natural thing to do for us to, 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 to come together in pain because it is a great pain. Mm -hmm. But, but to, to plow a way forward, you know, together. Listen to some of their words again. Out of personal pain, we as a family want to share our family legacy, which is to see the humanity in everybody. We're all traumatized by everything, but my father did not teach me to hate Israelis or Jewish people. We got from him to stay human and stay in solidarity and empathy. There's a remarkable organization among many remarkable organizations, including Breaking the Silence that Marion mentioned earlier. There's a remarkable organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. This is Rabbi Dalia Shaham, and she is sending us a word of greeting from Rabbis from Human Rights in Israel. Reverend Muriel, for this invitation. Thank you for, for everyone who are here with us, listening and viewing. My name is Dalia Shacham. I'm a rabbi and a member of the board of the organization Rabbis for Human Rights. It's a cross-denominational association of Jewish spiritual leaders who are concerned with sounding a voice and taking action for support of peace, justice, and the protection of human rights of all beings, of all humans in the land of Israel, including and adjacent to the occupied Palestinian territories. We've been working for the past 30 years in partnership with Palestinians and with members of all faiths and leaders of all faiths here in this country, promoting a vision, defending, protecting a vision of sustainable peace and partnership between all the people of this land and frankly, all the people in the world. What is in common to all of us in the organization, I believe all of us truly dedicated to faith is the understanding that every human being is created in the image of God, that there is divine in every single human being. And the faith that if that human being gets their basic human rights, 
then this divine image could come into light. What is also in common to all the people of this land, particularly those who are members of the Abrahamic faiths, the monotheistic faiths, is that we understand that there is only one God, that we are united in one being. Part of what we've been doing and is getting particularly challenging, but for that reason, even more important in these times is to counter the narratives that weaponize religion, that give visions of armed redemption. We are countering that by reconnecting to our roots in prophecies and commandments and traditions in the Jewish religion and also taking part and making partnership with other faiths who are finding these roots together, roots of understanding that the pursuit of peace is by, through peace, and that no armed redemption and no military action can bring us true peace. I've not met Dalia yet, but I'm looking forward to it when I go back to Israel. The West Bank is really struggling. People can't work. They can't move about. Uh, tourism has completely collapsed. So there's very high unemployment. People haven't been able to work their fields or harvest their olives. This is Anton from Rabbis for Human Rights. And he shared this little video about taking food parcels from Israel into the West Bank, which is quite a risky thing for Jewish people to be doing at this time. Today we're running an emergency food aid to uh, Palestinian communities in the West Bank. Well, we're starting to fill the cars with the packages and we follow this aid run throughout the day. Big shout out to Culture of Solidarity. The box is designed by uh, No Hope, a well-known uh, Tel Aviv graffiti artist. It says in all the languages, through the fog, a lighthouse. So I'm at the entrance to uh, the Fah Izmer, and uh, on the army installations here, you've uh, had people uh, uh, graffiti hate. Uh, Kahana Tzadak, the Kahana was right. Uh, you know, there's stars of David on it. There's uh, it says uh, death to Arabs around this site. Here we go, up here. Um, there's violent settlers who are abusing this to create more hatred and violence. And you know, we're here to do the, the opposite. Driving actually in quite a beautiful area along the Lon Road, which is in the South Jordan Valley. And this is the location of a number of Bedouin Palestinian herding communities who have been forcibly, forcibly evicted from their land, over 800 people this year alone, through uh, Jewish terror, settler violence, intimidation, aggression and violence. And we're on our way to one of those communities to, do, to deliver some food boxes. Well, seriously, it's another uh, humanitarian uh, trip. Uh, to uh, Bedouin uh, communities uh, and uh, we, are, we are here near Chizma uh, together with volunteers uh, and thanks uh, to uh, everybody who helps. We've reached the Bedouin community. Uh, they were forced off their land around the 24th of October and they're living here in the, in the valley now. They're, they're worried about the rains that are coming but they're happy to get the food relief. working for dignity, human dignity, in a time of war. I want to share now some prayers that Bethlehem Bible College 
has published by some of their students. And we're going to hear a number of different voices reading and they're interspersed with a couple of images. I pray and ask the Lord to bring his peace to this country and to stop the war, destruction and killing. To remove hatred from the hearts of the people and to plant in its place hope, love, peace and joy. So that this land will truly be a holy land for its inhabitants. Khaled Dali. I wish we could have peace with the King of Peace to make a spot of light that makes the vision of the world open and safe from war and with peace. <clears throat> For families who lost their safety to have safer homes and I wish for them a new life with new love for Jesus. Rose Mura. You can see the yearning in the artwork. I hope to see everything restored and I pray for all the people in Gaza and Palestine. I hope for peace for all the world. Wassam Khoury. Since 2023 is coming to an end, I would pray for one of my dreams now. And this is the dream of many Christian Palestinian students. That peace and love come to our world in the middle of a world that's full of wars and conflicts. I pray that the peace of our Lord spreads to everyone's world. That is my most important hope for now. Lord Saye. And this is an image by Sliman Mansour, who is one of the most famous Palestinian artists graphic artists. Marion mentioned EAPPI, the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program that's run by the World Council of Churches. This photograph of Our Lady of the Wall in Bethlehem was taken by an EAPI. It's a prayer walk along the separation barriers by Christians to the Greek Catholic monastery, which is right beside the wall. The vigil has taken place weekly since the wall went up in 2005. And I really urge you to look, particularly at their Facebook page, EAPI, E-A-P-P-I, and look for their eyewitness blogs because their testimony is powerful. Our Christian sisters and brothers in Bethlehem and EAPPI lead us to one more definition of bystander. In this Advent time, we look forward with yearning to the promise of God with us. This year, an Evangelical Lutheran Christmas church in Bethlehem, the crib scene, is set among rubble. Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac in a sermon preached on the 22nd of October after 18 Christians sheltering in St. Porphyrus Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza were killed, said, Beloved, in these difficult times, let us comfort ourselves with God's presence amid pain and even amid death. For Jesus is no stranger to pain, arrest, torture, and death. 
He walks with us in our pain. God is under the rubble in Gaza. He is with the frightened and the refugees. He is in the operating room. This is our consolation. He walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. If we want to pray, says Munter Isaac, my prayer is that those who are suffering will feel this healing and comforting presence. We draw our formal time of reflection to a close with a prayer from the Iona community and then an original song by Scottish singer-songwriter Margaret McClarty. Rab, I wonder if we could go back to the previous slide and have it during the prayer. Thank you. A Christmas prayer. When the world was dark and the city was quiet, you came, you crept in beside us and no one knew. Only the few who dared to believe that God might do something different. Will you do the same this Christmas, Lord? Will you come into the darkness of tonight's world? Not the friendly darkness as when sleep rescues us from tiredness, but the fearful darkness in which people have stopped believing that war will end or that food will come or that a government will change or that the church cares. Will you come into that darkness and do something different to save your people from death and despair? Will you come into the quietness of our towns not the friendly quietness as when lovers hold hands, but the fearful silence when the phone has not rung, the letter has not come, the friendly voice no longer speaks, the doctor's face says it all. Will you come into that darkness and do something different, not to distract, but to embrace your people? And will you come into the dark corners and the quiet places in our lives? We ask this not because we're guilt ridden or want to be, but because the fullness of our lives long for, the fullness our lives long for depends on us being as open and vulnerable to you as you were to us when you came, wearing no more than nappies and trusting human hands to hold their maker. Will you come into our lives if we open them to you and do something different? When the world was dark and the city was quiet, you came, you crept in beside us. Do the same this Christmas, Lord. Do the same this Christmas. Amen. Angel choir, virgin birth Dreams and visions, a gating star Can you Can you believe? 
Muriel, thank you very much for sharing with us this evening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for leading us through such an inspiring, um, yet challenging journey. Uh, the thing that strikes me is that it's peppered with so much hope in the midst of great darkness. And I suppose I'd like to, to start there just with that thought of I know that many people on the call tonight will have connections in Palestine and connections affected by what's going on there, as I'm sure um, from what you've shared with us, of course, you do. And I wonder if I might start with that question of what in a practical sense can we do? Um, I think, I think, I said at the beginning, you know, learn, listen, lament, protest. Um, we can't all do everything. So I think you have to listen to what your heart feels drawn to. Um, so the Balfour Project, for instance, is, is really campaigning to have the UK kind of right the wrong of walking away with unfinished business in 1917. Um, and that might that might float your boat. You might want to learn more through them, or there may be other things you want to do. I don't. I don't think there's one definitive answer. I do think that it's important to keep doing what the Christian Aid Prayer says about holding Israelis and Palestinians together in our prayers because it's very easy to end up polarized. Mm. And the, the struggle seems so unbalanced and one-sided, but it's really important to remember uh, the other side of the story and the fear that riddles Israeli society. Um, and I, I just think having, a, having an open-hearted, approach helps 
Absolutely. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so perhaps I could finish on a, a slightly personal note then and, and ask you, obviously the current situation has brought you away from a place that, that was, I'm sure, very dear and, and a place where you were being called to serve in, as you said yourself, a very different way. What's your own hope on a personal level? Is it to go back? Is it to be there once again? I do hope to go back. Uh, I have a project that I've been working on, um, which is to develop a prayer garden uh, around the church in Tiberius, which is right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it feels a bit, you know, it feels a bit frivolous just now when things are just so awful. But in the medium to longer term, a place where people can come and and pray together um, it is going to be really important. So I'm working on that. And I think there'll be a lot of rebuilding of relationships with partners where Jews and Palestinians have worked together, but October 7th just shattered their trust in one another. And uh, I don't quite know what that will be like, but a lot of our partners are struggling to find out how to move forward. But what gives me hope is organizations like Breaking the Silence and Bet Salem and Rabbis for Human Rights, who are going against the flow in society. The majority of Israeli society still supports the bombardment of Gaza, still supports the war aims that the government has expressed. Um, so it takes a lot of courage to be saying, let's see the human. Absolutely. And I was incredibly struck by the idea that you shared of, of not lighting the second Advent candle. And I'm, I'm sure that there will be many taking that idea back to parishes, back to priests, back to pastoral councils and, you know, hopefully sharing ideas like that to raise awareness. There, there is a link that I'm sure Rab will share that can, can send you to that. Um, that you know, there's, there's, there's um, PowerPoint slides and things that you can use. But equally, there are some people that have been horrified that in the time of Advent, you would be minimising whatever little light there is. So I don't, you know, it, it will work for some people and not for others. Which seems to be the, the message of the evening, isn't it? But thank you very much, Muriel, um, once again for being with us. And I'm going to hand back over now to Marion. Muriel, what can I say? You've woven together so skillfully and movingly the voices of so many who, who seek a non-violent world as we do. We can't be bystanders, especially having heard all of those voices and your witness. We must be non-violent activists as never before, acting human in the face of inhumanity, as we heard at the beginning of your very, very uh, moving um, presentation. So thank you so much, and may God bless you in all that you do. Thank you. Loving God, we thank you for the insight, wisdom and compassion of Muriel. We thank you for what she has shared with us this evening. We ask that you continue to empower her with your spirit and sustain her with your love. Amen. Thank you so much, Marion. And Marion, we would like to offer a prayer for Pax Christi Scotland. Um, we know that this weekend we'll, we'll be having our annual general meeting and we bring this prayer in preparation for that as well. We pray for Pax Christi Scotland and all member organisations of Pax Christi International. Empower, empower them as they follow Jesus in ushering in his reign, 
a reign of peace, of respect, of human rights, and justice, and reconciliation throughout the world. Amen. Amen. And Our now we pray. Forth. And now let us pray for ourselves as we go forth as disciples of Jesus. Spirit of love, help us to be at one with all those who mourn. Empower us to honour the memory of those who have died by committing ourselves to usher in your reign of peace and justice. Strengthen us and guide us as we confront those who commit or condone genocide or ecocide. Amen. 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 Thank you to Muriel and Marion and to all of you who've joined us tonight. We do hope to see you again next Thursday when we welcome back as our companion Omar Haran.